Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. Hi, I'm Nick. We got married in 2018, and my beloved wife is Clara. Currently, we reside in Oklahoma. I am the proud owner of a small lawn care company that offers various services, including grass and lawn mowing, edging, trash removal, lawn care, fertilizing, weed control, and pest control. Our services cater to both residential and commercial customers, and sometimes we collaborate with government agencies as well. By the way, let me tell you a little bit about my wife, Clara. She works as a sales representative in a grocery store. Despite our busy lives, Clara and I often spend time together, carefully planning our future. The only thing that keeps us apart during the day is work, but as soon as we return home, we are quickly reunited and enjoy each other's company. I love Clara deeply and am always concerned for her well-being, and I am sure she reciprocates. She surprises me with original gifts, such as a wristwatch or a grooming kit, and on other occasions, she goes above and beyond, arranging romantic dinners for us in a vintage style. I am always happy with her care and attention. Of course, I reciprocate, and I know she appreciates it. Unfortunately, we have not been able to have children since Clara has had several miscarriages. Fortunately, after many trials, Clara was finally able to conceive and give birth to our precious daughter, Sonia. As parents, we were happy and eager to give her the best of everything. Given the difficulties and challenges that Clara faced, we decided to hold off on having more children and focus on raising Sonia. So, we moved forward, showering Sonia with love and care. Along the way, Clara became close friends with a woman named Angela. It turned out that Angela worked in the same industry as Clara but in a different place. Clara met Angela at a colleague's birthday party, and they soon became fast friends, spending a lot of time together. Clara's new friend, Angela, often visited our house, and their friendship grew stronger over time. As it turned out, Angela had a great influence on Clara, involving her in various outings and social activities. Soon after, Angela introduced Clara to her group of friends, and they started going to carnivals, parties, nightclubs, and even clubs. When I tried to express my concerns about such events, Clara brushed them off, saying she just wanted to have fun and experience real freedom. Still, I reminded her of the potential dangers of associating with the wrong people and infecting her with negative personality traits and energy. Nevertheless, she insisted that she was a grown woman and knew what was best for her. Moreover, she assured me that almost all of her friends were married and responsible people, asking me not to worry. But as time went on, she started coming home very late, neglecting her chores, and no longer spending time with Sonia. She stopped taking care of herself, and as a woman, I had to take over more household chores, such as cooking, cleaning, and laundry, and caring for Sonia. When she arrived home, she uttered just one phrase, I believe you will always provide for me. As time went on, I noticed her new fascination with her looks and outfits. She spent a lot of time on makeup and her choice of outfits before parties. She would change two or three outfits before she settled on an appropriate one. She spent a lot of money on expensive perfume, cosmetics, and other jewelry. As time went on, she spent most of her time on the phone and did not want to communicate with me and her daughter. It felt like she didn't need Sonia and me anymore. During the day, she would retreat to the guest room or to some obscure corner of the living room, immersed in her phone. Eventually, she began sleeping alone on the bed in the guest room, browsing the phone, texting, and answering calls in a surreptitious way. One day, as she was brushing her teeth in the bathroom, her phone began to vibrate. She deliberately put the phone on vibrate, so I decided to answer the phone. A man's voice came out of the machine, asking, Are you on your way? In response, I asked him. The man interrupted the call as soon as I asked, Who are you? Clara burst into the living room when she realized I was answering her call. What are you doing with my phone? She shouted, blazing with anger. I'm your husband. Isn't it proper for me to answer your calls when you're not able to? I objected. In most situations, that would be inappropriate, she replied. You should only answer in exceptional circumstances, such as an emergency. Next time, be kind enough to let me know you're calling, not to answer for me. Otherwise, 
You better mind your own business. Seriously, Clara, this is unreasonable. How are you acting? You didn't like it either if I took your phone without asking. Clara turned around and went off to dress up for another party, and I could not calm down and continue the conversation. By the way, a man called asking if you were coming. Who is he? It's none of your business, she replied. Are you sure? I asked. Yes, I'm sure, she replied, and then quickly fabricated a lie to cover up her deception. I don't know what you're implying. I'm getting ready for an important meeting with my girlfriends. Okay, have a good evening, I replied as she walked out. Subsequently, I took Sonia to a restaurant. On the way to the restaurant, my daughter said that her mother rarely spent time with us, and she doesn't care about us. She added somewhat lightheartedly. I tried to be tactful, presenting her mother as nice, saying that she was busy with an important meeting in town. She was silent for a moment, showing that she wasn't satisfied with my answer. Eventually, we arrived at the restaurant, and she looked flustered. Sonia and I had a great time and went home. Clara came home very late that night. I confronted her afterward, going straight to the point and stating that she was obviously having an affair with another man, although she denied the accusation, insisting that she was just spending time with her girlfriends. I warned her that her girlfriends were a negative influence and pointed out the state of our family, especially Sonia's well-being. The mother of my child, who often attended parties and other such events, ignored my prohibitions and warnings and continued her reckless antics. To make matters worse, I found out that she had recently started taking birth control pills. It had been months since I had had sexual intercourse with her, which made me wonder why she was on such medication. For several days, I pondered, trying to figure out why she was taking birth control pills. To make matters worse, she was so frivolous that she left the pills in plain sight, implying that she was no longer worried about hiding her infidelity from me. Instead of trying to hide her actions, she came up with a scheme and accused me of infidelity. I pondered how I could permanently expose her so that she would never think about cheating again, and then I had an epiphany. I noticed that she remembered to take birth control pills every day. I was sure she had a lover, maybe more than one, and to avoid pregnancy, she takes birth control pills. But she probably didn't expect me to be stupid and to understand everything at once. When she left the house one day, I carefully studied the pills she was taking, paying attention to their characteristics such as size and color. I even took some samples and went to the pharmacy. There, I frankly explained my situation to the pharmacist and asked for a different kind of pill similar to the one I got to prevent pregnancy, but this drug was intended to treat another disease. I asked the pharmacist if he could suggest an alternative without obvious side effects. He grinned and answered in jest, Buddy, you must be a real rascal. To his joke, I replied, my wife is cheating on me, and I want to teach her a lesson with these actions. I vented my anger and pleaded with him to help me in my plan of retaliation. I'll see what I can do, he replied. His words brought me great relief. Without delay, he rummaged through his pantry and quickly pulled out pills very similar to the ones I had imagined. In fact, it takes great care and attention to detail to notice the differences between the two pills. I hope this helps, I muttered to myself as I paid the pharmacist. When I got home, I carefully shifted the new pills into the old container, making sure that the quantity remained unchanged. I tried not to disturb the place where she kept the pills. I devised a plan to trap her and waited impatiently for her to return home. I watched her every move carefully, waiting for her to take the pills, but she didn't. Fear gripped me, for I feared she might have noticed the change. Nevertheless, I waited patiently until the next day. I watched carefully as she poured her usual prescribed dose into the palm of her hand and swallowed it with a sip of water. She didn't even realize she had taken the new pills. Victory was mine. I was very glad that she found no difference between the old and new pills. Unknowingly, she continued taking the new pills for over a month. After three months, she started going to parties less often. She stayed home more often and tried to be a better mother to Sonia and a better wife to me. I was aware of what was going on and watched the situation unfold. She was trying to seduce me into having sexual intercourse, but I rejected her advances, 
offering silly and irrelevant excuses that it wouldn't happen. Sonia, for her part, did not want to spend time with her mother. She avoided her as much as possible. As time passed, her belly began to enlarge, and it seemed that her lover had rejected the pregnancy and abandoned her. One morning when I was going to work, she came up to me and informed me that she was pregnant. I couldn't help myself and burst out laughing, which made her feel humiliated and ashamed. How did this happen? I asked in disgust. I can't believe that you continued to cheat on me despite my efforts and love. You thought you could get away with it, I continued, looking at her with a mixture of hatred and disgust. Something must have gone wrong. I never meant for this to happen. I know I cheated on you, but I never planned to get pregnant. How come I was on medication? She replied. You still shamelessly ask me these questions? I replied. You've gone completely berserk and lost your sense of shame, cheating right under my nose and thinking you can get away with it. You even went so far as to put a container of birth control pills in front of everyone and take them in front of me just to prove to me that you were cheating on me and that there was nothing I could do about it. Whoever instilled this confidence in you didn't have your best interests at heart, your stupid girlfriends and your lover managed to ruin your life. I declared, I outsmarted you by changing the pills, and you were too careless and didn't notice the difference. You kept taking them for days because you were so consumed with your reckless affair, not paying attention to the pain, grief, and frustration they caused me and Sonia. You never cared about Sonia's well-being or how your infidelity would affect her psyche. Instead, you enjoyed your promiscuity with your crazy lovers and what you called your circle of friends, I continued. I hope they will be there to offer you comfort and support as you face the burden of this pregnancy. When I finished speaking, she burst into tears and accused me of being cruel and heartless. Shocked, she claimed that I had made her an object of ridicule among her loved ones and colleagues. She told me that all her friends had dumped her as soon as they found out she was pregnant, and the man responsible had denied paternity and told her never to contact him again. Well, that's what you got, I laughed. Come on, Nick, how could you do this to me? Don't you remember that we're still married? I laughed briefly and watched her while she talked nonsense. Her tone turned serious as she approached me, begging me to help her meet this man and get him to financially support their child. I answered her that she was crazy to suggest such a thing to me. Are you sure you're thinking straight? I asked and then hastily added, to be honest, you stopped being my wife the moment you started cheating on me. You're nothing more than a corrupt woman, and soon I'll be out of your life forever, I replied. All day long, she pleaded and cried, asking me to change my mind, but I paid her no attention. The next day, her mother came to our house to plead with me on behalf of her daughter. I greeted her politely and listened while she spoke. When she finished, I expressed my gratitude for her advice, but I reiterated that my decision remained unchanged, including the question she had raised about giving custody of Sonia to her, Claire, if I went ahead with the divorce. I added that there was no way I would allow that to happen. I argued that Claire was unaware of Sonia's needs and was indifferent to her emotional and mental well-being. Suddenly, Claire burst into tears, begging me to forgive her and return her daughter. Claire added that she had realized her mistakes. Claire crawled on her knees, begging me. I love you both, Nick. I can't explain what came over me, and I can't bear the thought of living without you and Sonia, tears streamed down her face. Her mother cried beside her. I told them that it was too late to cry over past mistakes and that I wasn't going to change my mind. They pleaded with me for a while longer before they finally gave up. Her mother decided to go home, and Claire packed her things and followed her mother out. Two weeks later, the divorce papers were ready, and I signed them. I was supposed to deliver them to her home for her signature, but upon arrival, I was informed that she had been hospitalized. She was hypertensive after returning home and her condition had worsened the night before, leading to seizures and a partial stroke. I was shocked by this news. I wondered what to do next, should I go to the hospital to see her or go home? Faced with a dilemma, I remembered that she was still the mother of my child, so I decided to visit her in the hospital. When I got there, I was saddened to see her in such a pitiable condition, her skin pale and flabby. Moved by compassion, I gave her mother some money and entrusted her with the divorce papers to give to Claire when she recovered. 
Later, I came home and cooked dinner for Sonia. That year, I met a beautiful woman from Pennsylvania. She came to Oklahoma for a contract job that ended, prompting her to stay and start over. She started working in catering and opened a fast food place. One day, we visited her place with Sonia, and as she came to our table to take our order, I caught a glimpse of her. She was modest and unassuming. After we finished eating, she admired how charming Sonia was. To my surprise, she walked us to the car and said something that has been bugging me ever since. She said, Sir, I truly admire your daughter. She's incredibly charming. Would you mind if I took her to lunch at your convenience? I'll arrange a free meal for her every day. She explained that this was so that she could see Sonia every day. As she came closer, she gave Sonia a warm hug. We got in the car and drove away, but Sonia kept talking about her nonstop. The next day, we visited her restaurant again and gradually became closer. I learned that she was a single mother of two who had lost her husband and young daughter in a tornado several years earlier. She only had a three-year-old son left, which explains her affection for Sonia from the moment she saw her. After becoming acquainted with her personality, I made some discreet inquiries into her past and was fascinated by her story. I asked for her hand in marriage, and she gladly agreed. Sometime later, we were married, which was a life-changing event for both her and Sonia. With the arrival of a son and daughter, our family grew by two. Later, I learned that Clara had actually given birth, but unfortunately, it was a stillborn child. Regrettably, she was unable to make a complete recovery from the seizures and strokes she endured. Despite exhausting all her resources, including the support of her loved ones, her condition only showed marginal improvement. The stroke impacted the entire left side of her body, forcing her to rely on a wheelchair. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this story. Now here is another exciting story for you to read. The price for treason may be too high. If people always remembered this, there would be more happy families. Gentlemen, if there are film writers among my listeners, then you can safely write a script for a film based on this story, a story about adultery and terrible karma for it. Karma that will change the whole life of a cheater forever. Hello, my name is Bibiana, and I would like to share my story with you. It's about the indelible scars on my face, which made it disfigured and unattractive. Dealing with it was not easy, as I faced embarrassment and countless questions from strangers who showed interest in me. It was a constant struggle, and I was constantly reeling at night, considering myself ugly. There were moments when I thought about giving up and getting it all over with. I felt unnecessary in this world. No one seemed to appreciate or accept me for who I was, let alone love me the way I wanted. The scars on my face became a yardstick for measuring the amount of affection, love, care, or attention I received from others. More often than not, People use my condition to mock, ignore, and slander me. In doing so, they have forgotten or perhaps do not know that I was not always what I look like now. When my husband Hillary married me, I was an elegant and charming lady fresh out of Canadian catering school, where I excelled in catering and hotel management. At the same time, Hillary was a skilled carpenter and sculptor. After getting married, we relocated to North Carolina to start our new life together. It didn't take us long to adjust to the environment and establish our businesses. Hillary's craft thrived, and he quickly became one of the leading figures in woodworks, sculptures, and carpentry in the entire state. His exceptional skills and Midas touch earned him a reputation and fame that soon spread across the region. With our financial stability, we could afford whatever we wanted and traveled all over the world. For a while, I also did catering, but eventually, Hillary asked me to join him in building his company to make it even bigger. I became one of his top sales managers, and we lived happily ever after, enjoying the beautiful life together that one can only imagine. However, there was one thing missing from our union, our beautiful children. Despite all our attempts, we could not conceive. We explored every available medical option, but nothing worked. I offered to adopt, but Hillary was against the idea. Instead, he assured me that he loved me just the way I was and didn't mind if we never had children. Instead of the joy of raising our own children, we spent our time visiting orphanages, foster homes, schools, and sanctuaries. Hillary was very attentive to my happiness and well-being. 
He often tried to rekindle our passion and devotion to each other. By specially arranging vacations, trips, and expeditions to various places in the world, time flew by. Before we knew it, hours turned into days, days into weeks, weeks into months, and months into years. It seemed like a dream. In the fifth year of our marriage, we planned a three-week camping trip to the mountains of Tibet in the fall. Interestingly, there are two Everest base camps, with one located on the south side of Mount Everest in Nepal, which is the more popular one when people talk about trekking to Everest base camp. The other, located in Tibet, is on the north side of the mountain. We made plans to visit the Tibetan Everest base camp in a few days and stay there for three weeks. Even from Shigats, the nearest town on the Friendship Highway between Tibet and Nepal, you could already see the snow-capped Himalayas peeking over the skyline. It was an enjoyable experience when we arrived, and it was my first time visiting the site. Hillary had been there once before during his undergraduate years. It was amazing to see people from all walks of life and different nationalities camping there for extended periods of time. We met several groups of people who had camped there for more than six months. Over time, I started chatting with some of the people we met there, as well as those who came after us. Among them were two good-looking guys who met each other at the camp and caught our attention. These fellows named Thomas and Williams were very sociable, attentive, and charming. Thomas was a young Australian who had been at camp for over a month, and Williams had arrived two weeks before us. They greeted us warmly and shared their experiences of being at camp. We quickly became friends and had fun together, sharing good food and wine as if we were one big family. While we spent time together and had fun playing chess and worth, we were inspired to expand our camping experience by trying our hand at fishing. Armed with hooks and lines, we set out on this new adventure, and it turned out to be the highlight of our trip. The two men with whom we had such good conversations were very attractive. I was blushing and feeling lightheaded around them, and to my surprise, they had similar feelings for me. From their communication with me, their gestures, and body language, there was an unspoken connection that Hillary was completely unaware of. I was quickly taken in by this fascination and found it exciting and captivating. I made the decision to hide my feelings from Hillary whenever they were around, especially if Hillary was asleep or busy with something else. I looked forward to their company. The men quickly figured out my game and willingly helped me fulfill my vicious desires. They began to sneak into our tent when Hillary was not at home, and this went on for several days. The intense passion and lust that arose between us made our intimacy an inevitable next step. I could not understand how I had gotten myself into this situation. After exchanging contacts, the men bombarded my phone with nude pictures and explicit messages. They would often inquire about Hillary's whereabouts whenever he wasn't with me. One day, we got carried away and engaged in dirty talk over the phone. One of them suggested we have some fun in a secluded area of the forest. I immediately agreed, thinking it was a thrilling idea. My desire had already consumed me, and the next hurdle was figuring out how to sneak away from Hillary and join the men in the forest. I had become a willing participant in their mischievous plan. I considered three options to avoid being caught by Hillary. The first was to wait patiently for him to fall asleep before sneaking away to join my two lovers. The second option was to wait until Hillary was busy reading or hiking on designated trails in the camp and then make my escape. The third option was to get him drunk on his favorite wine until he became intoxicated and fell asleep. All three options seemed real to me. I ended up cheating on Hillary multiple times during our camping trip having intimacy with two men over many days. We even did it late at night when everyone else was sound asleep. The two men liked me so much that they extended their stay at camp for another week. By this time, we had been in camp for three weeks. One night, I got Hillary drunk out of her mind so we could sneak off into the woods for our usual intimacy. While we were having a good threesome, both men were completely naked, and I was wearing only an open shirt. Suddenly, we were surrounded by a pack of hungry wolves. At first, the wolves growled at us, which caused us to stop our activities and watch their behavior. Although they posed no immediate threat, both men attempted to continue engaging in intimacy when they held out their hands for further kissing and caressing. The wolves bared their teeth, howled like thunder, and pounced on us like mad. The wolves attacked us with such ferocity that I feared they would tear us to pieces with their sharp fangs. 
they ripped pounds of flesh from both men's naked bodies, leaving them in a pool of their own blood. I too was brutally mutilated all over my body. They bit down hard on my cheeks and mouth, making it feel like they were trying to eat me alive. My two lovers lay unconscious while the wolves massacred them, inflicting numerous wounds. Luckily, I mustered up the courage to run away. I ran as fast as I could, thick blood dripping from my face and various parts of my body. I managed to get back to camp and rushed to our tent to tell Hillary what had happened. Fortunately, he was conscious and lucid. Hillary reacted quickly and alerted the forest guard, who promptly responded to the situation. In the meantime, I required immediate medical attention due to heavy bleeding from my wounds. I was promptly transported to the on-site clinic where my wounds were washed and bandaged. While they dealt with my wounds, they repeatedly asked me what had happened. I was torn between telling them the truth and making up another story, so I decided to lie, claiming that we were just walking in the woods when we were attacked by a pack of wolves. Hillary was insistent on the details of the accident. I told him that Thomas and Williams had accompanied me during the walk when the wolves attacked us. Hillary began to ask me if they had managed to survive, he was greatly concerned about their fate. I answered with a heavy heart that I did not know whether they were alive or not, for the wolves were tearing them to pieces very quickly. The forest guards arrived, and one of them approached Hillary to share his observations. Sir, he began, you may have to ask your wife to tell us what happened. We found wolf tracks, blood, and flesh scattered in the vicinity. Unfortunately, Thomas and William didn't make it out alive. We found them lifeless, and strangest of all, they were both completely naked. Completely naked? Asked Hillary in a state of shock. At that moment, I felt a wave of panic sweep over me. It was obvious that my deception had been exposed, and I realized that I could no longer lie. Why were they naked? My husband asked, his voice trembling slightly. I hesitated for a moment before I answered, I'll explain everything to you later. The forest guard insisted that I give a detailed account of what happened, warning that if I refused, I would be held responsible for the tragedy. They threatened that I would have to face legal consequences once the investigation began. I felt a sinking feeling in my chest. I wanted to dissolve into thin air. I knew that the coming shame and dishonor would affect not only me but Hillary as well. I tried to make up a story about the wolves ripping off their clothes, but that was illogical, since the animals could not remove their belts and shoes, which were found neatly folded and hidden under bushes nearby. My lie was easily exposed, and there was nothing left for me to do but confess. I felt utterly murdered and confused, admitting that we were engaged in intimacy when the wolf pack viciously attacked us. I was the only survivor, and I barely managed to escape their clutches. I suspect it was because I was wearing a shirt at the time, though I can't say for sure. Hillary's demeanor was depressing and discouraging, and he hung his head in shame as he retreated toward the tent. I followed him, sobbing and begging for a chance to explain myself. Explain what? He snapped back, his anger palpable, as he walked inside. I knelt beside him, desperate to make things right, clasping his hands. I wept uncontrollably, consumed with remorse for allowing wickedness to consume me in just two weeks with some unfamiliar men I had never met or encountered before. In spite of the agony I felt from the wounds on my face and body, I paid no attention to them. Losing my marriage and my husband was now my biggest concern, and I did my best to make amends. But it turned out that the damage had already been done, and the situation was irreparable. Hillary violently wrenched his hands from my grasp and pushed me away warning me that he would aggravate my injuries if I touched him again. I collapsed to the ground and sobbed inconsolably for a long time. Without hesitation, Hillary stopped the hike and informed me that we would be returning to North Carolina the next day, adding that I should prepare for a divorce. It felt like my heart was about to burst out of my chest, and a feeling of despair, humiliation, and hopelessness overwhelmed me. At that moment, I wanted to fall to the ground, terribly ashamed of my infidelity to my husband. Nevertheless, I acknowledged that I was fully responsible for the whole ordeal. I let my desires and lust rule me. From the moment we boarded the plane, we sat at a great distance from each other like complete strangers. He seemed to have done it on purpose to avoid my incessant screaming and pleading. As soon as we arrived in North Carolina, 
It dawned on me that I had left home a contented married woman and returned a disappointed, frustrated, and severely wounded single woman who would struggle with physical and emotional scars for the rest of her life. Thinking back to the wolf attack just two days earlier, I remembered how quickly they had killed Thomas and Williams, leaving me as the only survivor. I sobbed uncontrollably as we stepped off the plane and into a cab for the trip home. Despite my fervent pleas and cries, Hillary remained indifferent throughout the trip. When he arrived home, the first thing he did was to call the legal representative who set up an appointment for tonight. I was alone in the house, trying to unpack my things. I called my older brother who lived in town and informed him of my plans to visit him right away. Upon my arrival, I told him offhandedly about the events that had occurred during our trip, which made him furious. He frankly told me he could not help me, and I had no choice but to accept what was going on. Two days later, the necessary divorce papers were prepared, and we both signed them. As we parted, I had to stay at my older brother's house for a while to get adequate care and to recover. Unfortunately, the condition of my wounds worsened, and surgery was required. The medical professionals had to remove part of my body to sew up the damaged areas on my face, resulting in a noticeable scar. My formerly attractive appearance was no longer the same. Fortunately, after five months of active treatment with powerful drugs, I recovered. Despite my ugly face, I could not afford cosmetic surgery, even though the doctor had warned me that my chances of survival were only 50%. Thus, I had no choice but to move on with my life. For a long time, I remained lonely. No one showed any interest in dating or even being friends with me. Finding a job proved difficult, as most of my applications were unsuccessful. My goal was to work temporarily to raise enough capital to get back into my restaurant and hospitality business. It took some time before I got a job as a junior employee at a cathode factory in Tennessee. After working there for almost two years, I quit to start my own restaurant business. Staying on the job, my appearance repeatedly caused me shame and ridicule because of my looks. I was assigned to less glamorous roles in a manufacturing firm, mostly doing routine and inconsistent work. One day, I had a sharp confrontation with a senior employee who berated me for going into the reception and waiting area to talk to the production manager. I tried to explain that I had a valid reason for being there but she made it clear that ugly people like me were undesirable in that part of the company. I was so upset that I cried all day after I got home. This incident eventually led to my decision to quit. During my walks, people often ask about the origin of my extensive facial scars, and I have to make up a plausible answer, explaining that I was once attacked. Sometimes I come up with a different explanation. This kind of talk often causes me to have emotional breakdowns. After my divorce, I left all my old photos and pictures on my social media accounts unchanged, and they remained there for a short period. I had many suitors who expressed sympathy and made grand promises while chatting with me. But when we finally met in person, they were disappointed by my appearance and even ridiculed me for pretending to be someone else. Although I tried to explain that I was really the same person, many started laughing and quickly walked away, blocking me completely. After numerous similar situations, I made the decision to update my profile picture and photos reflecting my current appearance. Unfortunately, this was the last straw. No one else approached me about love or dating, and those who did, as a rule, were only interested in finding someone to satisfy their intimate desires and nothing more. As a result, I am still single. Well, it's called karma has reached its goal, gentlemen. Do you think this story is fair? And don't forget your powerful likes. This channel really needs them. See you soon, gentlemen.